Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. Hi guys and welcome back to the Lamplight Project Study Guide Fellowship and we're on section 11 which is interpretation in the early church and we were working our way through worksheet 1, early Christian doctrinal arguments. But before we go on to the next question, Alistair, could you open in prayer, please? Yes. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I'd just like to thank you for bringing us all here safe today yes. and helping us with your word. And even though we wander into other things, and it's all about your word, yes. And helps us, helps me, and hopefully helping other people out there listening yes. to understand about the things we're learning, mm. teaching today. Mm. Yes, Lord. I just like to thank you in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you for that, Alistair. Well, as I say, we're on section eleven, and we're worksheet one, and we're under the heading of early Christian doctrinal arguments, and we're going on to question four. And question four is think about and discuss. Division developing church in Israel, and we're given the passage Romans 11 1 to 32. So, I think before we, we go around the table and answer that, we should read Romans 11 1 to 32. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start? Sure, you have got the Bible in hand. Yes, do you not want to start? No, I'll start. I'll have to find it, but I'll start if you, you start want. If you, okay. Yeah. <coughs> save me waking through okay Romans 11 I ask then did God reject his people by no means I am an Israelite myself a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin God did not reject his people whom he whom he foreknew don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah how he appeared to God against Israel Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. Am I the only one left? And they are trying to kill me. And this was God's answer to him. I have reserved for myself 7,000 who will not bow the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear, to this very day. And David said, May their table become a snare, and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution to them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forevermore. Again I say, did they stumble so as to fall behind recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if the transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? I am talking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the Apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry, in the hope that I may somehow arouse, arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. But if their rejection is the <coughs> reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, 
for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the Gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. (coughs) Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. What in verse 33? Yeah, three. Three, yeah. I thought it was only 1 to 32. Oh, it is. Oh, You're right, okay. enough far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's why I stopped there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to pay attention after. <laughs> so, back to the question. The question, think about and discuss division developing church in Israel. Any thoughts, Alistair? Anything? I don't actually. That's okay, that's okay. That's fine. Well, hopefully by the time we work through this question, you'll have a better idea of what the question's about and Mm -hmm. what the passage is about as well. Um, Any thoughts? Anybody? Well, what stands out for me is the intention that, you know, that Israel's going to be saved anyway mm-hmm. you know that's um, verse 26 and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written then shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob you know that verse really yep. mm-hmm. stands out there either mm. if we, we look from from verse 17 if some of the branches that have been broken off and you though a wild olive and you though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share among the nourishing sap from a group would you not consider yourself superior Mm. to the other branches if you do consider this so it's saying the branches that are grafted in is talking about the Gentiles coming into the right. Jewish, the Jewish yeah. church, if you like. That's mm-hmm. Not exactly the way, but think of it that way. So this is the Gentiles coming in amongst the Jews. They've been grafted in. And it's saying here, do not consider yourself to be superior. Okay? And then if we continue reading on, if you do consider this, you do not support the root. So the root mm-hmm. is, is the Jewish roots if you like you're not supporting right. them you think of a plant the root supports the branch that makes sense it's mm-hmm. because of the root that the branch is growing not because the branch is there that the roots growing so it's, it's quite a good analogy that there um you do not you do not support the root but the root supports the branch you will say then branches were broken off so that you could be taken in so there's been sections of the jewish community if you like have been have rejected this to give them access to it. Is that making sense? The Gentiles has been given access to this. Um, granted, but they were broken off because of their unbelief. And you stand it by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So that's quite a stern warning that okay, you've been given access to this and you've been brought in, don't be arrogant about it, Mm -hmm. don't be boastful about it, because the people that were there initially, if they were cast off, cut off, think how easily it is for an outsider to be. Uh So, Mm. does that make sense? So so is the church in the (coughs) question the Gentiles? Mm -hmm. 
the the church initially was for the Jew. I know it says that God wants everybody to be saved, but initially the church was for the Jew. And very roughly speaking, because they didn't accept Christ, it was opened up to the Gentiles. Now, I know it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's a kind of... Because the, 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 Jew, the Jewish people rejected Christ, uh -huh. therefore it was opened up to the Gentiles. Now, it's a lot more complicated because yeah, that, that was always part of God's plan. You, oh, you find yeah. that right away mm. back in the beginning. Yeah, that it was, was for of, everybody. But, but Doug's right at this point that that's... Jesus came first to the Jew mm -hmm. then to the and Gentile. then to the Gentile. That's it very simplistically yeah. oh. to, to try and give you an understanding of it. Because they rejected it, it was opened up to the Gentiles. So this is what this is talking about, that the branches are grafted in. The Gentiles are grafted into the church because of the disbelief um, of the Jews to, of to, the Jews to that. Jesus. So is, is that making any sense, Alistair? What I've tried to explain there. I know it, it's quite a simplistic explanation and there is a lot more to it than mm -hmm. that. But just from the passage we've read, trying to give you an understanding of what's going on there. Yeah. You follow on yeah. that? Yeah. I love how Jesus uses agricultural terms and situations to mm -hmm. give a picture of what he's trying to explain. Because there's farmers they were, on that, aren't they? Yeah, they yeah, understand yeah. that more, don't they? Of, of yeah, what, yeah. And it's really good to know. And that. But like somebody, you know, trying to explain something to you, well, you, you know joinery. So if they were to allude to it in joinery term, mm. you would get the idea of what they were talking about so much easier mm -hmm. than that if they were talking about, yeah. I don't know, whatever, something that mm -hmm. you had no understanding mm. of. Um, so... Can, can I just read you a little bit from... The next chapter, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. kind of goes on to yeah. just say, um, verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think yourself more highly than you ought, and that you've alluded to that when you were talking about... Um, don't, don't think yourself any well, better. That's what scripture says. Yeah, yeah, and it says it again. Um, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And then it goes on um, about a body having many members. But it, yeah, it was just don't think of yourself more highly than you, than you ought. That um, you mentioned that when you. And again, it's back. You know, we've been given this section of Romans 11 mm -hmm. to read 1 to 32 to really get the grasp of that you really need to read Romans 9, Nine. 10 and 11 mm -hmm. because the three chapters itself are basically about the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles and the way the church is and the way they've been brought in and as you can see as Sean has brought out you go on to 12 mm -hmm. so it's very hard to read a wee bit in isolation yeah. to get the full to picture the full of it idea, but yeah. definitely read 9, 10 and 11 to get the feel of what's going on there um, it's quite a study in itself Romans 9, 10 and 11 it's kind of the in real simple terms that the past present and future of the nation of Israel in 9, 10 and 11 when you look at it that way okay. so you, you, you'll get a grip of it there yeah because Paul in chapter 9 at the very beginning lays out um the attributes, if you like, mm -hmm. of the Israelites, of the yeah. Jews, and you know that they're adopted as sons, and and they were given the promises, and the patriarchs came from from Israel, and so on. <coughs> so he kind of lays the the ground as to who the the Jews are, mm -hmm. and um, how God has worked in them and through mm -hmm. them through all these centuries. Um, and then he talks to the Jews, he's actually talking to the Jews here, that um, their offspring, that is their ancestors, the people that follow them, um, will be reckoned not because they're Jewish, not because they're natural children. It says in verse 8 of chapter 9. In other words, it's not the natural children who are God's children. And we've looked at this about circumcision of heart rather than yeah. circumcision of body. Um, it's not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as mm -hmm. Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated, at that point in time I will return and Sarah will have a son. And he goes on and lays all that out, <clears throat> Alistair. And then he turns his attention, if you like, 
to the part of the church that was present, the, yeah. the Gentiles. Mm. Um, because Jesus did come first to the Jews and it, all the apostles are Jews, you know, and, and so many of the disciples. Jesus and Jesus was a Jew. <coughs> but some of the Gentiles who were coming in were basically saying that they were better than the Jews, you know, and, and that, that division developed as time went on. It became more and more obvious that um, some of them were blaming the Jews for the death of Jesus. And of course, we know we're all to blame, right. um, not just the Jews. So Paul is answering these arguments that the Jews are God's people and they are the natural Mm -hmm. root, mm -hmm. never mind the branch, mm -hmm. the, the, they're the root, you know, and they are the natural branches. And we who are Gentiles, or those who are Gentiles, have that privilege of coming in to join that... Grafted that in, gra that's Yeah, right. onto that tree. I mean, they're using the picture of a tree, you know, about grafting um, branches and that into a tree. I never, I never knew about that so much, like... Gardening. Uh -huh. no, I'm, I, I'm not a gardener, but I studied that with a friend who who does gardening, uh -huh. and she explained that mm. to me when we did uh -huh. a chapter eleven, yeah. well, and we that had, helped me yeah. to oh, so you uh -huh. know, so yeah, yeah, because we had a tree in our garden at one time, and that's what it is. It was a it was a cherry tree, but it had wild apple grafted onto it because the cherry's uh -huh. too fragile. So and uh -huh. so it's this kind of thing, you know yeah. that. Yeah, they're using that picture. They're using the stronger so, root uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh, for uh, something that's put in that yes, isn't so strong. Because uh -huh. the root wasn't it. just going to support the natural branches, it was going to support these wild branches, mm -hmm. which are mm -hmm. us around this yeah. table. Um, and so everything that the Gentiles were benefiting from came from that root and the natural branches, mm -hmm. who were God's people, the, the Jews. Um, but as time went on, you know, more and more there was a division coming in, which is what we're just, um, looking at, that many of the Gentiles started to think that they were the church mm -hmm. and the Jews had no part in it. And yet Paul is laying out very clearly in chapter 11, and as Duke says, read chapters mm -hmm. 9 to 11 mm -hmm. to get the whole picture, that the Jews are not forsaken. God hasn't turned his back on them. And I always say to people who want to argue that, if God turned his back mm. on the Jews, then what makes you think he wouldn't turn yeah. his back on you? Because mm. he's a covenant-keeping God, he's a promise-keeping God. If he doesn't keep his promise to the Jews, then what hope do Many we people have? don't want to acknowledge the Jews um, mm, that's right. today in church. So. Yeah. And Look I mean, what's happened to them? I know, oh, yeah. you know, and that's because, yeah. really, they're God's people, and then yeah. they, they rejected him. Yeah. You know, but they, we, we see even at this time that there's a there's a Paul's warning them: mm, do not yeah. consider that's yourself right. to be superior. So there's obviously something going on that they think mm. they're a wee bit special yeah. because mm -hmm. they, they've been accepted in, or, or, or whatever way that they seem to think about it. I mean, there's a couple of mentions there. Um, do you not consider yourself superior? Um, where else did I see it? There's, there's something about an arrogant. Do not be arrogant. That's right. And in, in verse twenty, do not be arrogant. So that must have been going on. There must have been an arrogance and, and this feeling of superiority. Mm. But they were some special. For Paul to address it, he wouldn't have addressed it if it hadn't happened. Mm. Um, and I think. No, no, I was just going to say, that we've got to bear in mind, <coughs> if we go on to verse 25, um, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Now, this is going on to another subject again, but you know, we'll mention it. There's going to be a set amount of Gentiles that come in. Mm then that's it. Um, and this way, all Israel will be saved. And uh, as you enormous. brought out there, Heather, that there's, that, this is future mm -hmm. prophecy that's talking about mm -hmm. that we'll look at later on, as mm -hmm. we keep saying. Um, but bear that in mind, that there's been a hardening in part for Israel. So this has happened for a reason. Mm -hmm to allow the Gentiles in, but there's going to be a period that when the full number are in, that's it. 
Now, when that period is, I don't know, there's all sorts of debates and speculation on that and all sorts of theories. And the more you look into that and the different aspects of it, the more you can agree with each one. But that's not what we're talking about at the moment, so we'll leave that alone. Um, if we look at chapter 10 as well, Duke, yep. um, Paul starts off by saying, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, and that's what we're talking about with the Pharisees and so on, aren't we? Um, they did not submit to God's righteousness. And lots of Christians do that today. They're trying to find their own yep. path to righteousness instead of submitting to God's. So Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend in the deep, into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? And, and this is the part that I, I wanted to emphasise. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm. And I could go on, but that's the point. You're as this... Same. Uh -huh. And that's yeah. the point that Paul's making in chapter 11. The, the Jews are not forsaken. Mm. God hasn't mm. turned his back on them. Any Jew who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord will be saved. And many, many have over the centuries. And in the beginning, it was the Jews who believed and then brought Gentiles in very early on. Even mm. Peter with Cornelius and, and yeah. things, you know, people like that. Um, so Paul is very much making this point, which a great portion of the church in the West does not mm. believe today, that God's promises to the Jews, the word that he uses are irrevocable, he mm. won't go back on them, that they are the natural branches and ultimately all Israel will be saved. And, that, and mm. there's a verse that talks about the commonwealth of Israel, doesn't it? And that's all the Jews and the Gentiles together. Yeah. But you can see even from verse 11 uh, as we've said that there is an attitude developing oh, yes, very by the Gentiles yeah. that, mm. that as, as we've spoken as we've read through there's an arrogance and there's what was the other word that said um, conceit do not consider yourself to be superior so yeah mm. conceit yes, and an arrogance yeah. uh -huh. So that's starting to come in, and as we've said, Paul wouldn't be addressing that if it wasn't quite yeah. widespread. And, and again, it wouldn't be all Gentiles, yeah. but there was obviously yeah. a certain um, proportion of them, and and that's gone on through the ages until we reach replacement theology, where much which of the we'll go on to, church, yes. <laughs> yeah, which much of the church today does not, uh, much of the church today believes and contributes to, mm. you know, and it's it's a precursor for the next. Um, um, passage of, of the, the study um, this division developing. Well that, that that's the start of yeah, one yes. of the things, there's quite a number of things uh -huh. that actually I wouldn't say there's a split but there, there, there's, well division mm -hmm. you don't get division without a split mm -hmm. so obviously there is a split but so we see there that, that <clears throat> that's kind of our first indication that there's something going on um, and obviously it gets worse mm -hmm. and worse and as we've alluded to the the replacement theology and the anti-semitism um, when I first heard the expression anti-semitism I had a clue what mm -hmm. it meant not a clue um, do you know? no it's like a, an attitude of anti-Jewishness mm -hmm. right. for, for the want of a better mm -hmm. description it's 
almost to the state of hatred towards the Jews. So it's like what Hitler has. Yes. Yes. He was anti-Semitic and, and, and you get all that still yeah, to this day. Right. And this, the same, the same Semitism, that first part, it, it's because of who they were descended from, um, which is Shem, mm-hmm. you know, Noah's, one of Noah's sons, and that's where that word kind of comes mm-hmm. from. So it's like, if you're against Christ, you can be an anti-Christ. So mm-hmm. if you're against the Jews, you're anti-Jewish, anti-Jewish so you'll be anti-Semitic, yeah. Alistair. Right. Um, that's, mm-hmm. that's the word you have heard bandied about mm-hmm. very much in yeah. the last well, I few never months. I what it meant at all. As we were approaching the election. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it still goes on today. You're so doing. it's a hatred of God's people. Yeah. Of God's chosen people. And if you look throughout history, you can see pockets of that here, there, just and everywhere. Just keeps repeating, doesn't it? But if we're all one in Christ, yeah. if we're all one in Christ, then does that not supposed to be affect us as well? I mean, that's why we should be very much looking, and we do, as, as the Jews are the brothers and sisters mm-hmm. in Christ. That's how we're all one body. Yeah, Jewish believers. So are. we're not Jewish, but we should stand shoulder to shoulder with our Jewish brothers and sisters who are saved. Yeah, and and to stand with God's people yeah. in Israel, you know, the, yeah. the um, those who are still in Judaism, mm. because God has a plan and a purpose mm-hmm. for them. And script, scripture is very mm. clear. I don't understand people who read mm. scripture and, and, mm-hmm. and can't see that, that God's hand is still on mm. them. And in the end times, God has a particular plan mm-hmm. and purpose mm-hmm. for the Jews. And if Hitler had been able to wipe out the Jews, then God would have been proven to be a liar. And that's mm. what Satan is aiming for and hoping mm. for. If he can prove God to be a liar, then he's greater than God. Mm-hmm. And of course we know that will never happen. Um, but how is a, a believing Christian you can't have empathy and understanding mm-hmm. for the saved Jews? I don't know. I don't know. Um, where, where are you in your walk and what is it you actually believe? Well, we saw in the, in the last section we done, you know, we worked through that if Christ isn't raised from the mm-hmm. dead and then all yeah. the repercussions. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're taking scripture and... Literally. <laughs> Or if you're not taking mm-hmm. it literally, it's what I'm trying to bring right, out, yeah. yes. right? If you're not taking it literally, or if you're adding allegory or, mm-hmm. or, or something yeah. into what you're reading, you can see how yeah. the message is going to get mm-hmm. completely Warped, distorted, twisted, yeah. mm-hmm. which is why I tried to bring that yeah. out in the oh, last section, that yeah. you just, you take this one wee bit mm-hmm. and, it, and look at the repercussions from this one thing. wee thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're reading the whole of the Bible, and allegorising, we're going to cover this a wee yes, bit as well, but if, yeah. if you're out, say you read a passage and it was quite literal what it meant, and such and such is going to happen and this is going to go on, and you're saying, no, but that really means mm-hmm. X, Y and Z. Mm-hmm. And you're basically, you're basically making it up what it's going mm-hmm. to mean to suit, <laughs> to suit whatever you want yeah. it to say. Okay. Well, you can see how your whole theology is going to be completely mm-hmm. distorted. So in a way... If that's the way you've been taught from the pulpit, you can understand why they don't have the understanding yeah. that the, the Israel and, and mm-hmm. the Lord's plans for Israel and the Jewish yeah. people. And again, that takes us back to things we've talked about before. This is people swallowing what's mm-hmm. coming from the not, pulpit and not, not checking it, it against God's mm-hmm. word. And yeah. so when I was saying, you know, about um, saved Jews, well, I think the church are all right with saved Jews. That's okay. But it's the unsaved mm-hmm. Jews that they have this problem with mm-hmm. and, and believing that the church has replaced mm-hmm. the Jews, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. You're in Romans just now, Alistair, yeah. right? What, you're on nine? Nine here, yeah. Right, well, so just as a daft example, Romans nine, okay? If you weren't checking your Bible and I was up in the pulpit mm-hmm. and I said, I'm going to read from Romans nine and I started saying, well, once upon a time, Jack and Jill went up the hill, like, and, and you're actually reading that here, like, what? Mm-hmm. If you're not reading that, you're just going to take my word take for it. Take word for what it. I'm saying, I know that's a really stupid example what I've just given, but you can see where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. And so often people don't have their Bibles with them in churches yep. now. And it has been known for certain sections of the church, certain pastors, to have scripture mm-hmm. up. I don't trust scripture mm-hmm. up on an And it's a cut and paste job. And they half and one it, thing and yeah. half they, they take sections from this chapter and I've a, mm-hmm. just a verse maybe from another which totally changes mm-hmm. the meaning so if you don't have 
a proper Bible, a good mm-hmm. Bible in front of you? How do you know that what you're seeing and what they're yeah. seeing is the truth? Right. Um, so, like, even that daft example, you, you know, you can be looking at the moment tonight. I never thought about anybody to do that before. Oh, yeah. you know, I've yeah. seen yeah. that yeah. on a website of one of the mega churches. It was two half verses. Mm taken and joined and to make together. it look like one passage and it was on one of their mm-hmm. I think it was on the front page of one of their websites mm-hmm. and it's like wow yeah. so and and that, that comes from a hatred of God's people mm-hmm. and actually a hatred of God's truth as well mm-hmm. because they're well, it is doing exactly what Revelation tells us not to do mm-hmm. you know altering mm-hmm. it we're not mm-hmm. even supposed to alter a jot no. or a tittle all. Yeah. and they're altering whole sections mm-hmm. of it um, we could name names but we won't no <laughs> No. Um, it's horrendous. It's horrendous. And of course, at one time they wouldn't have had the capability of doing that. Yeah, yeah. So, technology that can be so useful can be used for such Ill. Yeah. But the New Testament's um, horrific warnings about deception and false teachers. I mean, throughout the New Testament, Jesus warns again and again. So, check everything. Test everything. And I mean, Paul's heart for his fellow Jews, for Israel, is is so heavy, you know, because he says in chapter 9, verse 3, I could wish that I myself were cursed Mm -hmm. and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. That's some burden. Mm-hmm. But you take where Paul came from. I mean, he, obviously, we've spoken before, he knew the law and he was well trained in the yes. law. And then the persecution that he caused to the Christians, you know, the up and coming church, if you like. And then the realization there must be, you know what I mean? Okay, sins are forgiven. There must still be something there, what you've done mm-hmm. to these people. You must have some kind of guilt or something. <coughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that that's, that's bound to be burning away. And then Christ takes away our guilt and shame, mm-hmm. but you still have that Memory. knowledge of that's what yeah. I did, and he speaks about that. He was chosen said. specifically, so obviously the Lord's known all this yeah. and known his character, etc., etc. He wasn't just picked at random to do what he was doing. So the Lord's known all this, and he's used all that. So it's all for a reason Um, and that's why Paul was sent to the Gentiles mm. as well because he was a Hebrew of Hebrews and um, he knew the law and and he said that he lived by that law I mean I think he was a godly man in mm. that sense um, very much so so he had that understanding of Israel of the Hebrew scriptures of the Hebrew people and yet God sent him to the Gentiles so he could take all of Israel's history, God's promises, the thread that runs all the way through of the promised Messiah and take that to the Gentiles with an understanding from both a Hebrew, a a Jewish mindset and then actually be able to reach out to the Gentiles and and put that in place so that they were being taught properly about God's love for the Jewish people. So there should have been a melding of Jews and Gentiles mm. in the in the church, and there were in, mm. in lots of places, mm-hmm. but very early on, as, as you were saying, I just read you something. In. I know it's it's in the next page, but it's just because we've been discussing it. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense. Okay. Justin Martyr described those who promote allegorical interpretation of scripture, which we've just been talking about. Some who are called yes. Christians but are godless, impious heretics, teach doctrines that are in every way blasphemous. Atheistical, atheistical and foolish. So well, I know we're going on to look at that. What I thought we would do is once we're finished this question, we'll look over the yeah. next question uh-huh. and then read the whole yeah. of that again. It's just because because this will make more that. sense now uh-huh. we've worked through some of yeah. those questions. And if we, we skim mm-hmm. through the questions to give you an idea what we're going to be uh-huh. asking, obviously you have any and then read this mm-hmm. in light of it. Mm-hmm. I think it should yeah, yeah. open it yes. out a bit. But, yeah. no, but that, that, that was that's a relevant. point. It's very really relevant. relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see this as a start of some kind of division happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can see, as we've said before, how not reading the scriptures properly or not interpreting them the way they were supposed to be interpreted, which I'll go on to mention in amongst yeah. this as well, can lead you off 
on a completely different route. Does that make any mm-hmm. sense? Because that's what's happened with this division, Alistair, that um, Gentile believers weren't reading scripture literally Mm -hmm. and there's passages and I'm sorry I'm not very well so I can't recall them at the moment but there's passages um, in the word which tell you about the blessings and and we've read some of it actually in these um, chapters in Romans about the blessings that are theirs because they were God's chosen people the patriarchs came from them all of these sorts of things and you find people who are anti-Semitic, and that is what they are, um, will see that these blessings are for the church. They're mm. not for Israel. Mm-hmm. And any curses where, or anything bad is Was, for the Jews. Yeah. And that's not what scripture says at all. But they'll twist it so everything good it's is for the, the church, church. And everything bad is about those Jews. That was the, the you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. and they twist it all. And that's, as Duke is bringing out again and again, that's why it's mm. so important that we read this word literally and where there are allegory mm. and metaphors, mm. be aware of that mm. and, and be sure that we're, we're reading the plain meaning of the mm. text. And I mean, the lamplight brings mm. that out again and again and again. Um, and, and that we're, we're not looking to invent mm. meanings or things that suit a particular mm. bias says, that we have or <clears throat> preference that we C. have. Sian Byron says we are not to be lazy. As we read yeah. this. Study to show yourself yeah. approved. And is it Peter Williams that says that the text of the Bible needs struggling with? As I am. As Sian that says We have to there. wrestle with it. We have to wrestle with it. You need to yeah. struggle we with it. wrestling with this for 2,000 years in antiquity, he said. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> so, so we need to continue that. Yeah, and I like Daryl Bock when he's talking about that as well. If, you, if you're working your way through it and you come up, mm-hmm. how did he word it? If you come up with a... A theory, oh, a new theory, a new theory yes. that nobody else has come up uh-huh. with before. Your chances of being right are pretty slim. Right, slim, so, right. That's <laughs> right. That, that made me smile yes. when you I said that. I thought that was yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. But if you think about it, there have been people studying the work for thousands of years. Mm. So, literally, the chances of you find something in there that nobody else has noticed before are really slim. And if you do come up with something that nobody else has came up with before Starbucks says your chances have been right <laughs> are pretty slim <laughs> so I thought that was good yeah um, on this question we're trying we're trying to stay away from the next questions no, which, which isn't working so no. I think we'll, we'll move on to our next questions and it, everything is relating into each other the yes. way the questions are Um I'll just read the bottom of the page here um, before we move on. Whilst advice from the interviewed academics is that the Word of God is to be understood both in a literal and a spiritual perspective, the plain meaning of the text, co-text and co-text, with careful study is the order of the day. We read out of the text to get the meaning, which is exegesis, rather than reading in rather than reading our own meaning into the text, which is eisegesis. The latter, meaning eisegesis, leads to allegory and metaphor. However, the believer who studies the word has the promise of the counsellor, and it quotes John 14.26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of all that I said to you. And I think you brought that out mm-hmm. earlier, so yeah, uh, I didn't John. It was down the so mm-hmm. there, I know we've covered it. So there's an exegesis is taking it out of the text. Mm-hmm. So the way I remember that exegesis, exit, you're taking it out, and then eisegesis is you're reading the scripture and you're basically making it mean what you want it to mean. Mm-hmm. And it says there, that leads to allegory and metaphor. So, we'll go on. What I thought we would do before we read the next page is skim through the questions just to give us an idea of what we're <coughs> looking for. And then we'll read the page in between. So, going on to worksheet two, we're not actually going to do the questions just now. Just look through the titles. The first one is, what historical events would contribute to a philosophy? A philosophical view. The second question, the influence of the Gentiles into the church. The third question, 
problems regarding a milk or even a baby food diet of doctrine. And the fourth question, the difference between biblical Christianity and Christendom. So if we keep those questions in mind and then read through the page that's in between. Now bear in mind this is a transcript of what the actual Lamplight video is. So this is pretty much word for word of what you would be seeing on the video. Shona, could you mm -hmm. start off on that and we'll just <clears throat> work round. Doctrinal issues continued into the second century known as the Patristic Age where the disciples of the apostles or early church fathers rebuked false interpretation of scripture. Methods of allegory and metaphor were hotly refuted. Justin Martyr, 100 to 168 AD, and Arrhenius, 130 to 202 AD, wrote regarding three classes of men, the heretics denying the resurrection of the flesh and the millennium, and the thousand year reign, the exactly orthodox asserting both the resurrection and the kingdom of Christ on the earth, the believers who consented with the just, that is James, and yet endeavoured to allegorise and turn into a metaphor all those scriptures produced for a proper reign of Christ. Justin Martyr described those who promoted allegorical interpretation of scripture as some who are called Christians, but are godless, impious heretics, teach doctrines that are in every way blasphemous, atheistic, I can't say that word, atheistic, that's it, atheistical and foolish. The early Christian church was a Jewish movement and traditions aside, scripture was understood mm -hmm. from a Hebraic perspective. However, Greek Hellenistic philosophy would soon bring its own influence. But why would certain people who clearly wrote about the love of God and Christ turn particular texts into an allegory? Okay. To begin to understand these kind of questions, we need to go back in time and visit Egypt and the great library of Alexandria, where we find a school of philosophers who debate the latest topics of the day. Influential scholars that would bring Greek philosophical thinking, philosophical thinking into an early Christian church were Philo Judeus, who was between 20 BC and 50 AD, a Jewish philosopher who used Greek philosophy to interpret the, old, the Hebrew Old Testament. His work influenced early Christians. Then there's Origen Amadeus. Is that how you would say it? Adam Adamantius. Adamantius. I'm glad you're here, Margaret. <laughs> and he was from 184 to 254 AD, a Greek Christian who used both literal interpretation and philosophy to interpret both Old and New Testament texts. And then we move on to Augustine of Hippo. Uh, he was between 345 and 430 AD. So we see there, he had, he had like three, four hundred years after mm -hmm. Christ, developed his own approach to philosophy and theology, accommodating varied, me, various methods and perspectives. And then we move on to John Chrysostom. Chrysostom? Chrysostom. 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 <laughs> Whatever. And he was between 349 and 407 AD, a popular preacher well known for his practical preaching and his controversial eight homilies against the Jews. It is debated whether he fueled anti-Semitic sentiment. So we see here that this yeah. going against the Jews quite well. Mm. It's coming out stronger there. Yes. Um, early Christian theolo theological development. During the early Christian period, methods of interpretation of scripture fell into two camps. A literal interpretation from the school of Antioch, where the plain meaning of text was understood within its context. And then there's allegorical interpretation from the school of Alexandria, where texts were viewed from a Greek philosophical perspective. <coughs> so... Is any of that making any sense? Uh, we'll, we'll open that out a bit as we go through the questions. But I think the bottom line there is that there's a literal interpretation and there's an allegorical interpretation. So, as we've said before, how can two people read the same passage and come to a different, a different conclusion. conclusion from it? And I think the whole point of this thing is, you know, it said back in the start of this that 
there's so many different interpretations. Well, why why is there so many different interpretations? I mean, how can different people, as I've just said, read the same passage and come to completely different conclusions over that passage? It's the way you interpret the passage. Whether the, and, and To me, a lot of people, oh, there's so many interpretations. Well, boiling it down, there's only two. You either take it literally a literal interpretation, or you turn it into an allegory. And if you're turning that into an allegory, you can make it mean anything you want. Whether you're doing it for your own gain, whether you're doing it through ignorance of the way you read mm. texts, mm. or whether that's the way you've been taught from the platform. So we'll, we'll look into this a wee bit. So moving on to worksheet two, um, which is headed Early Christian Theological Development. And question one on that is, think about and discuss what historical events would contribute to a philosophical view. Any thoughts? Well, I struggled with the question. That's okay. I had to go back and really, what does it mean? And what historical events? It was the doctrinal arguments that were the historical events. Because I'm when I look at something, um, I'm very literal. Well, I, remember like, I had a bit of trouble with that question yeah, as well because uh-huh. we've discussed a lot of these yeah. things in, in the past. But I thought, where are we actually going well, with yeah, this one? Because yeah. I was a bit. Um, yeah. But in light of listening, as I've written to section eleven again mm-hmm. and again, uh, world events changed the Hebraic understanding to Greek Hellenistic. So yeah. they were allegorizing sections of the Old Testament, yeah. and that had an effect. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Well, there, there's clues to that in what we've read before. Yeah, yeah, because even when you look at Philo Judeus there, he was a Jewish philosopher, mm. but he used Greek philosophy yeah. to interpret the, the Hebrew yeah. Old Testament. Why would he do that, you mm. know? Um, but that's because this Greek philosophy, mm. with this great library in Alexandria, mm. Alexandria yeah. and so on, was coming to the fore mm-hmm. and, and people were absorbing those yeah. ideas. Scholars mm-hmm. were absorbing those ideas. And mm-hmm. so instead of looking at the truth, they were looking at it with a Greek philosophical mm-hmm. mindset which skewed everything yeah. they were looking at. And, and we've been talking about that, how what you've absorbed as you grow up, what you've been taught as you grow up. It's can like it's so easily lead you down a rabbit trail down the It's like path. it's not enough. We've said that so many yes, times. Yeah. God's word is not enough. So we need to add something to it. We need to, you know, pad it out or or give it my meaning because mm. I'm so important. You know, that, that type well, of like, thinking. It's like these, these I'm men... I'm afraid, guys, I'll oh, have no. to stop you there. Out of time once again, but we'll continue this yes. on in the next one. So thank you. Thank Thanks you all for your input and no, sorry please. for cutting you short no, there, no, Marlon. That's fine. No, we're we, out we, of can, time. we can pick that up actually. We'll go on to that in the yeah. next one. This is GV247.tv, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world, plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion, and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries and study materials. At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series, a powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on GV247.tv, our free service web TV channel. Does My Life Have Meaning? A powerful one-hour presentation produced from the Lamplight Project. With a free copy of the Gospel of Luke, This film is crammed with engaging interviews, film and graphics. A life-challenging film to those searching for answers. As distributors for the Jesus film, 
we offer this timeless movie based on Luke's Gospel. This clear presentation of the life of Jesus Christ has been viewed worldwide and translated into over 1,200 languages. We provide the film with a free copy of the Gospel of Luke. The Daniel Project is a popular TV documentary that presents an overview of Bible prophecy and an encouragement to read the signs of the times. Hailed as one of the best TV films to be made on the subject, DVD extras feature a heart-to-heart -heart interview about the way of rescue. Based loosely on the documentary, The Daniel Connection is a full-length feature film. This fictional thriller incorporates many of the themes promoted through pop culture and social media which affect people on a global scale. Launched at the Cannes Film Festival, The Daniel Connection points the ever-skeptical viewer to search the Bible for answers to life's deepest questions. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, please do not hesitate to get in touch.